All right. So uh, this month's um, Earthworks Purple Group the scholars are reading All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Uh, it's a collection of essays and poems uh, by women who are lobbyists or, or part of the kind of ecological uh, sustainable movement. Um, and it's edited and compiled by uh, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine K. Wilkinson. So uh, with that, um, there was, I don't know, a handful, probably 30 or 40 different different things. So um, I guess which which one stuck out to you? Um, Marcia, I know you were talking about something before we start recording. If you want to go ahead and share your insights. Well, what I noticed about the book, it uh, repeated a lot of the things we've read in other books. Yeah, I get done. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. Can you give us kind of a synopsis? Uh, since I didn't uh, read much of it, I don't remember. I know saving is saving, but uh, what were they saving besides the planet? Well, and that's that's a good question. So it it, it and it does bring up the idea of and it, um, which I think we've talked about is you know that, that saving the environment, you know, going going green, trying to fight climate change is uh, a racial thing. It's saving us from you know. From racism, it's saving us from the disparity and and the the otherness. You know, it talks about again climate refugees. Um, that that all these things that even when we're trying to save it, you know, on a on an earth level, we're also saving a lot of things. And so I think that's what each each kind of article or an essay kind of kind of dives into and. Why, it's one of those while we while we talked about a lot of these, you know, it's all kind of you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for summarized in an in an essay that's only you know up to ten pages long rather than two hundred. So it's and it's a lot more of this anecdotal um, type of type of thing, almost like some of them are written almost like op eds, um, and that's what they're yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, as you were talking about, I was, um, was remembering Catherine Hayhoe's um, uh, article about, uh, it's, her title is How to Talk About Climate Change, and, and she names the importance of talking about people, uh, like you say, it, it isn't just about rocks, and it isn't just about um, temperature gauges, and it isn't, it isn't even just about animals. Uh, but it's about it's about how people are impacted by this this stuff, and so uh, I, I really appreciated her again four or five pages. I mean, it really wasn't wasn't uh, uh, we've written or we've read full books on how to talk about climate change and how to don't think about climate, you know, all this kind of. But you know, pretty quickly she summarized, um, like you say, this is about this is about people, and these are the people that are getting hurt by this. Mm -hmm. um, there was one. Uh, I mean, there were several that I that I marked, but one of them is um, uh, by Colette Pichon Battle, an offering from the Bayou. Um, what page is that? Page three twenty nine. Um, again, obviously, it's talking about Hurricane Katrina, um, and it starts talking about climate refugees. And there's an and there's an area here. Uh, and I will read, these communities are fighting discrimination within climate disaster recovery while trying to balance mass displacement of people uh, with an influx of others who see opportunity in starting anew. I hear people being called refugees, in quotes, when they leave or when they are displaced by climate disaster, even when they don't cross international borders. These misused terms meant to identify the other, the victim, the person who is not supposed to be here, are barriers to economic recovery, to social integration, and to the healing required from the climate crisis and climate trauma. 
words matter. Um, so it almost seemed like in, in this area that she, she does not like the word refugee. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's important to know that what a, you know, what a refugee is and what it isn't, um, which I've always thought is a good way of saying refugee. They're trying to find refuge, but she's also saying these people are, I don't know, it, 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 it's, it struck me as, as something to think about, and I'm not exactly sure and what what do we call refugees, or what is what is this that she's trying to mm -hmm. to point out? Yeah, I think I think that that is an interesting point. I think she she's trying to maybe in part say, you know, a refugee has has been you know, moved from their land, moved from their home. And maybe part of the point is she's saying the home is what's moved, right? I mean, the home is what's changed. Mm -hmm. The person is still there. The person is still the same. Um, and I, you know, I get her point too about um, anytime we use labels, right? We, we, we create another, we create a victim, we create uh, somebody that um, can be looked down on instead of empowered. Um, <clears throat> Refugee, it comes from the word refuse. And uh, refuse is something that uh, you throw away or it's become unusable and uh, you don't need it or it's in the wrong place. So you bury it or get rid of it. And people become refugees over in the various countries in Ukraine, of course, they're making millions of refugees every day or thousands of every day. And uh, they're doing the same thing in Yemen and many African countries. And it just stands to reason the first thing that goes it out of the into the trash is something that is uh, worthless or we think is worthless, is unusable trash. And so the lower income people and they want to racist or if you're racist, why somebody that's different than you is useless and is the first to go before I go, so they become a refuge. In other words, have to move or have to be moved forcibly or voluntarily somehow. And this book that uh, I didn't finish it either, The Uninhabitable Earth, was that the name of it, Marcia? Yeah, that's right. And I can't remember the lady's name, but boy, I read the first half of that, it's become, again, quite a redundant but you look at that and then my age people who are born in the 30s early 30s and still living we've seen a lot of changes in the weather and we haven't had to move a long ways from western kansas to eastern missouri to right here in eastern kansas in the last 90 years the weather's a lot warmer and uh, you know, that book pointed out the, the tragedy that is coming for millions of people, whether it's displacement from rising waters because the ice is melting or spreading of deserts when uh, Kansas becomes kind of like a Sahara in another 120 years. Where does the food production come from? And it's very interesting, you know, to think about that. We just had a brand new great grandchild born Monday night. So I'm thinking, well, what's that going to be like 90 years from now? That child lives to be 90. Fascinating thought. Yeah. What do I, I do about climate change? I can't really, I can save some plastic and use less water and uh, a lot of things like that that we can do individually. But yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, well, there's two things that, that uh, come to mind in, in response. Um, the first is the, the first um, essay of the, the first full section, Root, uh, calling in, and I'm not sure how to say this person's name, X-I-Y-E, uh, on page three. 
but she talks about the kind of the youth movement of environmentalism. Uh, to, that's what I think of when I think about your great grandchild, uh, Nick Peters, thinking about the, uh, the how many young voices say this is this is why this matters to us. Um, and uh, and this is a, a person. What is her? Uh, Otome Tolet, Toltec people, uh, as a, ten, a descendant of the Otome Toltec people. Um, and so this is kind of a, a she says, uh, youth, uh, youth of color uh, are, are starting to speak out more about climate justice. Um, and even right there on page six at the end of her essay, she says, this is what you can do. Uh, don't start from scratch, look for the initiatives that are already out there. Uh, maintain good communication with your peers and the adult organizations you partner with. Take good care of yourself and others. I thought that was a meaningful. Um, you know, that's part of what you can do to care for the environment is care for yourself. Yeah. Um, make your activism intersectional. Uh, don't tokenize. Don't just say, "Well, that's what uh, that's what young people think, or that's what black people think, or that's what women think." Uh, but but understand that there's uh, uh, we we are all exist at these intersections. Uh, don't do things the patriarchal way, the racist way, the exhausting way. Um, uh, I thought this was interesting. At, a, at events you hold, invite indigenous peoples to do land acknowledgments. And remember that indigenous knowledge is the foundation for addressing the climate crisis. Uh, have you all been in events where uh, indigenous people uh, kind of name uh, name the, the land and, and who... who uh, uh, possess this land um, uh, before for white people. Do you, you know what know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah. I think that uh, that that strikes me as something. Perhaps you know maybe there's ways even at the church we could be thoughtful about uh, some of that. Yeah. So anyway, it seems like there's some. Some cool kind of practical ideas in there. Um, well, one of the things that really struck me throughout the book, and then I read that last month too, how the political pendulum swings back and forth depending who's in leadership. Mm -hmm. And we have the same issues, uh, you know, big corporation versus the little guy and you have the fossil fuel argument and it just seems to just swing back and forth con constantly and it seems to be whoever's in power at the moment how you know i think trump undid so much it had been done and then biden is trying to bring it back but you know if uh changes again in 2024 who knows what it's going to be like and that really struck me. And not only that, it's so interesting because, you know, we're talking about envir environmental things, but we've been reading this Jesus and John Wayne book, and it's the same issues there. I mean, uh, it's so interesting. And of course, as a nation, we are divided about 50-50 on a lot of topics. And... So I don't know how you make progress when you got two sides that are const that are equally because I think we're pretty equally divisive. And um, I don't know how you reconcile some of those things. And uh, and like. Uh, like they're talking about the refugees and so forth. Well, I think in that chapter that Matthew was talking about, um, you know, she was saying we have refugees right here in America. People are going to be moving out of Miami and people are going to be moving out of um, New Orleans. And it has always confused me why people would build below sea level to begin with. And you know, right. things are rising, but uh, they seem, you know, they seem to go back and rebuild. And uh, I don't, I don't know how you handle that. I mean, I wouldn't want to give up my house, you know, so I understand in a sense, but I would never build in places 
already under sea level. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, uh, this is coming on the back back half too of the um, uh, article that Matthew referenced. Uh, again, this is uh, Colette Pichon Battle. And uh, she says, I thought this was interesting. She says, climate change is not the problem. Climate change is the most horrible symptom of an economic system that has been built for a few to extract every precious ounce of value out of this planet and its people from our natural resources to the fruits of our human labor. This system has created this crisis. We must have the courage to admit we've taken too much, uh, which is kind of what I hear you saying, Marcia, is it feels like we have tried to create these, these systems and create these places where um, yeah, we're, we're basically putting people, uh, we're building their houses underwater uh, because, because we can, because uh, they, they desperately need a house. And so we can put them there. Does that mean that the, uh, the richest uh, people in uh, New Orleans are living in those houses? Oh no, that's not where they live. Um, they live above sea level, uh, above and, and beyond uh, the effects of, of some of these. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's about taking, uh, and I, I think this is an interesting ethical, moral, and spiritual, uh, I mean, this is, is talking about, uh, you know, she is not using uh, spiritual terms, but it's, it's about greed. Uh, it's about uh, taking and taking and taking, uh, regardless of uh, uh, what it does to other people. Yeah, that reminds me of, um, it's the, uh, the article is Heaven or High Water by Sarah Miller. Um, and she's, uh, I think this is it. Which one is that, Matthew? Which chapter? Or, um, I think uh, 147, Heaven or High Water. Um, and she's going around to all these real estate, um, looking at uh, apartments and condos. And she's asking, you know, what about climate change and rising sea? This is in Miami. I can't remember if I didn't mention that. And all the all the, the real estate agents saying, oh, we, we've taken care of it. We've installed pumps. We've taken care of it. We're, we've raised you know, the street level you know, X amount of inches or X amount of feet. You know, and again, it's the same thing. It's uh, wherever we can get the most money, that's what we're going to build, even though it's not, not sustainable. Um, no. And, and I... I that article or those people, I don't, I don't blame the um, the real estate agents. I think they really generally believe that, and that's what they were told, right? It's it's always it's always a couple of steps up. That's yeah. that's the the real enemy, right? It's not the people you're directly interacting with is, that are making the decisions, right? Or or in some cases, I mean, and there there are some some cases where there's. There's a few really bad people making a lot of really bad decisions, but I think the other argument is, it's the system, right? Yeah. And so everybody's making a little bit of a bad decision that compounds to hurt people down the road, right? Yes. And so maybe the realtor uh, doesn't look quite far enough to see is this true? What happens when you know uh, Katrina? You know. And, and, uh, could they do a little bit more to make sure that somebody's in a safe place? Um, the, uh, the the next person up is the uh, the property owner, and maybe they think, "All right, well, my uh, engineer said it's safe, uh, so it must be safe." Uh, but could they confirm? Okay, maybe maybe it won't be. Um, well, or or they know it, but again, they need a job, right? If right, they say yeah, no, yeah. they'll they won't be hired, right? If you're a, if you're an architect or an engineer in Miami. And these are all the jobs that are there. You have to do it, or it just can go to someone else, and they're going to be a um, job, yeah, right? Realtor, right? right like right. I have to sell property, or I move. Yeah, yeah. Right? I can't, like, I can't just. It's not like I can't find another place to sell in Miami. It's like I would have to leave Miami. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So right. You, they're you, all they're all tied mm -hmm. to being part of, of the system. Yeah, yeah. So they they. You know, sell their soul a little bit to do that, right? And and and, and they have to if they're if they're not going to become a, a refugee themselves, yes. right? Right. And I think it's the same with people living in, you know, in below the floodplain. Yeah. Right. That means they have to move. Like they right. can't. Right. Like that's the only place they can afford to live. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, did you read the one about uh, West Virginia coal country? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean that's exactly what you're talking about, right? I mean, these are folks that that absolutely are participating in a, a, a system that is is causing danger to their neighbors. But I mean, what are they going to? This is the the job that they can get. This is the job that they have in these communities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know which one. If we have time, I'd like to discuss the climate solutions on 377. They, there's pages and pages of them. But I really think, you know, the church has done a great job. And I think a lot due to Mary Lee and some of her research, but I'm sure others have joined as well. But, uh, you know, like she went and got the funding for the lighting system in the sanctuary. And all those things are really important things to do. And then, you know, she, I think she's head of the collecting the recycling computer stuff, although she has lots of help. But, uh, and then of course she does the hazardous waste pickup. And uh, so the church is really doing a lot of things. And I think having the solar panel person uh, come, I wanted to come to that, but I can only do so many things in one day. And we had a lot going on Saturday. Um, yeah, so, that, oh, you're uh, right. And, and that, uh, the, the coal chapter talked about that too, we talked about the difference between clean energy and, and, and dirty energy, basically. And, uh, and you're right, that's, that is, um, you know, a, another piece of the puzzle, right? How do you, um, how do you, how do you help coal miners stuck in these dangerous and, um, you know, community killing jobs in West Virginia? Well, part of what you can do is think about how I can help the energy crisis on my property, right? Can I put uh, a solar panel on my roof? Can I do something? Can I participate in something? Can I turn out the lights, you know, in my own house to help, you know, crisis wise. So we're not burning more coal. So the, yeah, I think it is connected. Right. Cause especially in a capitalist society where it's supply and demand, right? If you right. don't use as much, the demand goes down, they won't be producing as much. Right. right. And they won't, and, and that will lead them to find where are they using energy? How are they using energy to build, to build in that? And you think those coal miners become immigrants or refuse. Right. Yeah. They become yeah. refuse and must be relocated or something done with. So everything well, I, has a, an opposite reaction. You know, the war, this war that's going on already, big fuss about the fact that uh, the current administration was the more green than the past administration. And so uh, going to reverse a lot of the green stuff and produce more oil and coal and carbon, carbon fuels. So we got to go backwards. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I thought that that's an interesting point you make about, um, you know, not only a refuge, right? Seeking, seeking a safe place, but refuse. Uh, you know, and I think that's one of the things that that, that Cole chapter does a great job talking about some of the um, uh, some of those West Virginia towns, uh, Eastern Kentucky towns. I mean, I've, I've got you know people I went to college with and folks that I know from that part of the, the world that um, that yeah, I mean these these communities they tear the tops off these mountains and then you know all their it, it poisons their uh, water table and, and all of a sudden all these uh, minerals uh, start flowing down into uh, so yeah if they are treated like garbage they are treated like uh, like refuse uh, and, and so yeah how, how do we how do we care for folks uh, especially when the, the simple answer is okay we'll just we'll just stop uh, uh, digging for coal right this this family that's dug for coal for their whole lives for generations upon generations uh, how, how do we find ways to to empower those people, to give them, you know, um, kind of alternative ways of, of living that are safer than being refuse, right? Than being, um, you know, abused in, in these ways. Um, you know, some of these, 
read some of the statistics on, on cancer rates in some of these small towns. Uh, and it's, it's just terrifying. It's, um, well, I don't know much about that area, but is it a windy area? Could they put up some windmills type things or not? Uh, that, uh, that <laughs> It depends on if it's on the top of the mountain or in the in the holler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it depends on how they. But yeah, but you're 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 thinking the right thing, right? Can can they they talk solar? Can they talk wind? Can they talk uh, you know geothermal uh, potentially? Uh, and and so that's that that is exactly the the way that uh, that, that I don't remember which uh, I got to find that uh, chapter now. But that's what she was talking was about. How do we find ways that um, that don't leave the community uh, helpless, but give them uh, uh, kind of give them what they need? Oh, there it is. Beyond the coal, Marianne Hitt on page sixty-one. And coal is just part of the deal. Oil and gas, oil particularly, is a big deal. Right. About these million barrels a day that we use and consume here in the United States, most of it, 25 or 30% of it, is consumed in automobiles. Well, we have to do away with the automobile. Uh, well, we make electric automobiles. So who's going to produce the electricity and what's going to produce it with? We got enough wind to produce that much electricity. Yeah, we I mean, how do you do sun. wind, solar, all of it, right? I mean, all, what are they, all the alternatives to, uh, uh, you know, I think it's that, that same chapter that talked about um, a, a post-fossil fuel world. Uh, and, you know, whenever she walk into a, uh, um, some organization or walk into a company or corporation and use those words, they'd laugh her out of the office, right? Oh, there's a, we'll never be in a post fossil fuel world. Uh, but you know, her point is eventually we will because we'll run out of them. So what are we doing now to get to get healthier uh, about this? Oh yeah, here's the other, uh, uh, Marsha, you talked about uh, earlier about different, uh, differing perspectives and you know, you have one, one party in power uh, for four years and then the next party in power uh, undoes all those things and starts over and, and um, you know, it, you mentioned 50-50 and it uh, reminded me again of that uh, Catherine Hayhoe uh, <clears throat> uh, article where she says, um, as vocal as, and she, she Quoted all these people that had, you know, made fun of her and, and said that she's a, you know, communist or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> she said, as vocal as such people are, and as much as they dominate the discussion, they're only a small proportion of the population. Seventy-three percent of people in the United States agree the planet is warming, according to a poll by the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And sixty-two percent of Americans recognize the main reason for this warning is human activity, specifically burning fossil fuels. That's about three quarters of the problem. And deforestation and agriculture, that's most of the other quarter. 73% uh, of us also believe climate change will affect future generations. But here's the big but only 42% think it will affect us in our lifetimes. Uh, so that is part of the question of, well, why do I not make a big, bigger deal about it? Well, we aren't even to the 50% in terms of folks that think it's going to have an impact on me. Um, and again, when it comes down to it, it's, it's, if it's not about me, then, then it's not a big deal to me. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it should be a big deal, right? It's, it's, are they just in denial? And it's easy to say it's not a big deal, therefore I don't have to do anything. Right. And then, you know, it's a, it's a cognitive. Right. right. Uh, it reminds me. There's there's an article or uh, an, an essay by Ash Sanders called "Under the Weather," page two thirty one. Uh, talks about um, uh, this friend that um, this this um, this lady, this woman met um, back in ninety one, uh, and he was very you know. Diligent about, about his carbon footprint, and he, you know, foraged and got his food, nuts and berries, and just bored 
t-shirts and, and shorts to, to, to class and stuff. And um, event, time passes and eventually, and, and this, this uh, the author says she, she kind of started doing the same thing and then met, met up with him later and he was married and had a house and kids, I, you know, all this stuff that he was against. And he's like, you know, finally I just, I had to because I was going insane. Uh. Um, and it's, I think it, it speaks to that weird thing of, and there's, it's a, it's a balance of, you know, how, how much, how sustainable can you be versus how, you know, comfortable, because, right, because the most sustainable thing is, is, you know, to die, right? right? right. <laughs> like, right. like, you, you take energy, right, to, to live, and so, um, you know where where are you on kind of on the on the spectrum of of, of that? So, you know, do you do you own a house or or do you rent or do you you know? And I think it, it just gives that gray area of you know what what is the lifestyle you choose? And with any any one of those lifestyles, there's sustainable practices you can do or unsustainable. And, and yeah. you know the fact that I, I don't know if it talks about it, but it reminds you know it is this point of you know. God created us to in, enjoy life and enjoy creation, enjoy, you know, the gifts that we're given. Um, we should be able to, to, to enjoy those and not deny those in the process of uh, saving money. Yeah, all right. It was an interesting article. Yeah. And, and, a, and on, that, on that note, it, it does... You know, and I think several articles mentioned that it's like you can live the most sustainable life, but you, and it talks about like the you know 2020 when people stopped driving cars and stuff. It's like it actually didn't do much mm. to to lower the. Um, I don't know if it mentioned it in in terms of of temperature drop or or, or of um, you know pollutant percentages mm. in the air, but it's like. It didn't do much. Like what we do really need to do is hit, you know, the factories and uh, yeah. and that sort of thing, and, and, the, and the corporations and the, and, the, and the building things and, and using things that way. Um, it's actually what what we need to do in order to to, to drop the and get back on. The, I think it's the two percent uh, or the two two degrees by 20, right. 2050. Um, so, which is your uh. Uh, your chapter, right, Marsha? Um, kind of the, the solutions. Uh, these, these are the things that we can do, right? Is that the one that you had mentioned, the one on 377? Yes, uh -huh, where the, she, they list page after page of solutions. Some of them I understood, and some of them I don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think um, to that point, what I, what I like about this is it's, it's kind of a... Um, a, a program or a, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, initiative where you go to the website, right? The drawdownreview.org. So you, it has all these and you can click on them and it's extra links and resources. Um, there's several spots in here in the book that have asterisks and underlines. And I think if you go to the website, all you can, all we can say, it has links and has those um, Oh really? Uh, connections. And it's like here, these these things are, are important, and it's it's an actual thing that we have a lot more information on, or um, you can look up. So it's it is um, kind of a multimedia thing that, that describes some of this stuff. I think more. Yeah, I haven't been on there. Have you? Did you get on the uh, drawdown.org, Marsha? Did I? Did I? I did not go into the. Internet. No. I, I just met a lot of those things I understand, but um, I guess there's a few that I really don't know exactly what they're talking about. But a lot of the things we already do, and I think a lot of people do insulation, high performance glass. I wasn't sure what dynamic glass was. Uh, green and cool roofs. We have eaten in restaurants that have goats on top and <laughs> right. and grass growing. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the scooters, cool right? <laughs> uh -huh. the, 
the scooters on Ninth and Iowa used to have that. Do they still have a, a grass on top of their roof? Oh yes. Did scooters um, do have that? I don't, I don't know if they do or not. I, I they did at one point, I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure the new one doesn't. I have to ask him. Yeah, there's. A, and I think all of these need asterisks because there's there's way to do it. I mean, just doing a green roof doesn't mean it's sustainable. Uh -huh. uh, you, yeah. Because it could actually be worse because you have to build a structure to hold up because dirt dirt weighs a lot. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so to be careful that like you don't actually just substitute one thing for something for that's potentially problem. more that's, less sustainable. That's not a do-it-yourself project. That's not, not a not uh, particularly Home Depot. Home yeah. Depot. Depot can help. I want to buy a green roof. <laughs> Well, like smart the uh, thermostats, we've had that for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, Chuck, do we have LED light, lighting or not? We don't. Not do throughout that. the house, but we buy LED lights when they need to be changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's Chuck's wind turbines. Yeah, the station had one of those where scooters is before they tore that other station right. down. Yeah. They had a small wind turbine up there. It was the gas station, not scooters that had the green roof. I no. thought scooters that had the green roof, but maybe I, yeah, I mean, uh, the roof with the grass on top. Yeah, yeah. Scooters, yeah. I thought, but maybe not. Yeah, man, you're right. Marsha, I'll tell you what, if we could do these four pages, man, it'd take a lifetime to do, but uh, it'd make a difference. But already we're doing some of them. All right, yeah. So, um, now we had a friend who used the uh, geothermal uh, underground, had it put in when they built their new house. Yeah, one of the projects we're working on now. Heat pump kind of thing. Yeah. yeah there's a church yeah. member who had that when they when they moved into their new place. They did geothermal. Well, who was that? Uh, I don't know if you would even. Well, who did you know. just say? A, a church member. She's not, oh, she's a not church been. member had. Yeah. Uh, the net zero building, what does that mean? I've heard that, I think they used it in the book too, but uh, what does that really mean? They're uh, not. It, it just means that it, it, it's, it's energy use, it, pr it produces just as much energy as it uses. So whether it's with, you know, photovoltaics or solar panels or you know geothermal or, or whatever that you're basically your energy bill is zero okay and that well and that also uh, it's it's kind of complicated because it also includes i believe it includes embodied energy so um which which takes into account the energy it took to make that item oh okay yeah. Is embodied energy, right? So uh, a piece of wood has lower embodied energy because of right, it's, it's a piece of wood, you can cut it down, it's automatically already there. Yes. Versus plastic, right? It takes a lot more energy to take it from whatever oil it was into um, and and concrete's pretty high just because it takes a lot of energy and heat to solve that right. stuff. But it lasts long. So yes, you have this front up upfront cost to make it, but it, it lasts long. So it's all kind of yeah. and what's that called? Embodied energy. Embodied energy. That makes but it sense, also right? takes right. But it also takes into account um, uh, transportation, right? Like right. Uh, you know, the house you built with the material that was found on site with stone and, and wood is going to have a lower embodied energy than you building a house that you know the lumber came from right washington or you know russia yeah yeah you know? right well yeah so that's the argument in the conversation sometimes about should i get a should i get a paper book or should i get a 
a digital copy of this book, right? Because um, uh, uh, this is cutting down trees, and so I don't want to cut down trees. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna get a digital copy. I don't have to, I don't have to have anybody come bring it to me. Um, but then the, the embodied energy is okay. But you're also putting a ton of energy into creating that reader, and you know, and then you and have how to often charge you it. it. And you have to charge it. And how often do you buy a new reader? You know, we say we're going to keep it for twenty years, but right. can we do it? And so, well, and then it also gets to the point of um, book trees. There are specific trees planted to mm. to make books. Mm -hmm. Like there's farms that people farm to produce books that the tree grows fast, right? It's pine, it's, right, it's right. Yeah. softwood. Um, it's actually done quite sustainably. Mm -hmm. uh, it's better than digging up, you know, whatever material it takes to, right? It's not a renewal, like, right? Like yeah. Wood is a renewable resource, right? Right. Versus the stuff in an iPad or a tablet is made from non renewable resources. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, also they mentioned here shift agricultural practices, but you know Chuck was raised on a farm, and it says conservation. Act, well, they practiced that for years, and regenerative annual pro, uh, cropping. Well, they rotated their uh, crops. Well, uh, and I think the the big thing with that is local farms versus industry corporate farming, right? right. Like the local farming thing is. Doing, doing pretty good. I was going to say, what you did, you know, years ago, Chuck, was exactly what, you know, environmentalists are saying everybody needs to do now. Yeah. Well, and then the problem is, in order to keep up with them, they have to then use pesticides right, or right. unsustainable practices yeah. in order to even make a yield enough to, to compete and stay in business. Much artificial fertilizer costs a lot of energy to produce it. Uh -huh. uh, and as you learn to produce more and more pounds per acre, it comes, there's a limit, of course, is how much probably that an acre can produce, whether it's fiber or beef or whatever, but uh, particularly on fiber, like corn or spinach or wheat, you increase the production per acre with more effective crop production, which they invent out at K State. They're constantly genetically modifying these plants and crops. And then the plant and the crop and the produce from it is actually minutely less nutritious, you know, uh, than it was before when it was smaller. So that affects the health of the nation. You know, this takes century or maybe generations before this is realized, but it has to be done. And there is a capacity limitation. You know, you can't produce only so much on an acre, like a truck. You can only produce so much pounds on it before it limits its capacity. You make a bigger truck, you get more capacity. But yeah. everything has its limitations and everything has its unconsidered what's happening, unexpected consequences, they call them. Well, and I think that the, the issue comes when um, we start taking someone else's rights in order to make, right, we hit our limit and so then we just start taking someone else's, mm -hmm. right, whether it's you know, and I think that's what it talks about. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, you know, talking about fair wages, right? And labor. Oh, I can make my, I can make this cheaper if I don't pay people as much. Right. I make it cheaper if I, you know, take people's land and and use. Mm. I need more land, so I, I I take it and I right. kick the people off and and right. force them to live on the, you know, the lesser land. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think that's it's the, it's a problem of um, you've either you know a become almost too efficient, um, or we you know it's 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 um, we become a product of and a, and a slave to our own privilege right. or our own uh, yeah. Which is why Success. I would you know and again I don't remember we're, we're four articles back so I can't remember who it was but the one they're talking about that 
we shouldn't use climate refugee, right? Because it's not climate change and the problem, right? It's it's greed. It's a right. it's a greed refugee. I don't know what she uses. Well, that it, when it was the word refugee that was in quotes that she didn't have oh, I see. problem. Yeah, with. yeah. And I and I, again it mentions the other and stuff. And so I think mm -hmm. the point is like calling them. A refugee is basically calling them them and not us. Uh, I gotcha. think is what it's going to. Uh, it's, gotcha. it's, it's yeah. putting it's 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 putting a stick uh -huh. between you and and, yeah. and the problem rather than saying no, those people have just as much right, right. to move. Yeah. Um, right. And so it becomes a matter of sympathy instead of empathy, right? I feel bad for those people, but I don't. But um, suffer with. I don't right. make changes to my life to make sure that they have a, a place to. Yeah, I, I think that's what she's. Yeah, no. But I'd I like, I that. mean, if, I think if it was one of anyone in that in the book, I'd like to have a conversation. If it was, it was her. Yeah. Say, hey, like, let's talk about this. Man, wouldn't work. that be great? And, uh, what if they have a, yeah. a uh, conference? Yeah, I'm sure, these... well, and I'm sure there's a way you can, you know, find that. I'm sure, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other the other article, don't mind me changing the subject, was about um, Wakanda didn't have suburbs. Oh, yes, I love that one. That was the first one I read because it caught my eye. It was good. Did you it all read good. that one? Which one was? Russia? Wakanda, the one about Wakanda. I think yeah. Let me let me find it. <clears throat> about Black Are Panther. You? Have you seen Black Panther? Have Explain that. I can't yeah. Know what you're asking. yeah, the comic book, the superhero movie, Black Panther, the Marvel movie. Yeah. I don't think uh, we've. I don't think we've seen it. I guess I've, I've seen, seen it. I saw the Pink Pat Panther. <laughs> Lots of times. That's a little bit. Really yeah. like Black Panther. I mean, it is. You aren't regarding. You aren't uh, referring to the black. The black. No, 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 not to the black, not to the Black Panthers, not to the uh, organization. Uh, okay. th this is a this is a superhero, uh, a Marvel superhero that is uh, so. In the story, uh, he is from an African. Well, well, you started the conversation. I don't want to take yeah. away your well, thunder. Yeah. So, uh, in in the um, uh, what in page the way, is that on? It's page one thirty eight. Um, so Wakanda is a, a fictitious um, country in Africa that um, I can't even remember what his name is. Oh, okay. The, the, the superhero is from um, that he he becomes the Black Panther, right? And and uh, this movie came out twenty eighteen. Yeah, I was gonna say about like four that. or five years ago. Yeah. Um, but it's it's always been a uh, it was it was a huge. Um, moment because it was it was all in, you know an all African American all black cast um which which isn't seen much and so uh, again it's it's um it hits on a lot of of of, of race, racial things and it was a very big cultural moment um for the, the black community to finally have uh, a superhero that they can identify with <clears throat> but um so this article talks about when when they were uh when the in the um, filmmakers were, were making the movie um, and they were trying to figure out how what would Wakanda look like as a as a city and, and a nation they thought it wouldn't have a suburb it would, it would be the the rural and the, you know the, the farmland and then it would immediately go to uh, urban skyscrapers and everything would be organic and it would grow from nature but the comments about how it wouldn't have suburbs because the idea of suburbs grew out of unsustainable practice. It grew out of, you know, uh, redlining, out of all this stuff that wouldn't have existed. White flight. And white flight that that you know, right? That the that the whites you know left um, left the the urban areas and and, and left because um, because the uh, black people were moving in and so. That none of that would happen, and, and, and the idea of a sustainable, <clears throat> perfect city would be: there's the areas for farmland and the rural areas, and then there would be um, the city and the these unsustainable kind of practice of 
single family homes, you know, built so close together and the idea of that large carbon footprint it takes to have to drive all that way into the city um, and that sort of thing wouldn't, wouldn't happen. And so it was it's just a very, it was a very interesting thing because it's, you know, it's talking about city planning and architecture and, um, and that sort of thing, but also cultural and kind of the, the racial undertones in the history of, of America. Talks about, well, this is, this is a utopia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. Uh, the Prudential so, Building in Chicago, most of you have probably seen it. It's uh, one of the taller buildings in Chicago, if not the tallest. And they tell me when we were there several times that, that a person could live in that building and have every facility. They would never need to leave the building because there was grocery stores in it. There were dentists, doctors, lawyers. Everything you needed to live would be in that building. You could actually live there and never leave. It's air conditioned at the summertime and heated in the wintertime. You didn't have to leave. There was water on every floor, of course. Uh, they did have a fire in it once. And when we were in uh, Doha, uh, the tallest, or Dubai, the tallest building in the world is there. And we went up that. And in China, there was some of these condominiums that hold 15 to 20,000 people. And in base of them, they all had show stores and shops and things where the people work. But in this one area, there's four or five of these big condominiums that the guide said, you know, there's about 100,000 people live there. And I said, that's all the people that live in Lawrence, Kansas, Douglas <laughs> County, right. Kansas, yeah. right in that one little area in these four, three or four tall buildings. Yeah. Yeah. So we got That's seven and a half billion people in the world. If you want to get them all to practice these uh, efficiency deals, most of them are starving to death now. I want to read this section from the, the book because it explains it much better than, than I do. And it's directly from the author's mouth. Uh, Kendra Pierre Lewis. Black Panther's vision of Wakanda rejects the oft-repeated story that we humans and our environment are natural enemies. Instead, it tells a story in which humans have become technologically sophisticated while maintaining a flourishing relationship with their surrounding environment. To paint this picture, the filmmakers borrowed heavily from existing African cultures, the Maasai people of Eastern Africa, the Zulu people of South Africa, the Sotho people of Southern Africa, and the Himba tribes of Namibia, among others, and asked themselves if these groups had not been colonized and had opted to live within their ecological limits, what would the result society look like? And to them, it looked like an urban core surrounded by countryside before giving away to true wildlands. Yeah. Was that author lived in Africa? Did that author Was live in Africa at any time? I don't think so. No, but again, it, and it well, and it also brings in the idea of right colonization, right? And the the um, right, you know, the conversation going back to oh, we just take the land, right? right. We uh, white people took land and, and made it our own that wasn't ours, right? And so it's it's also this very, you know, um, pro black, pro Africa move of what if all this bad stuff that happened to African nations and African um, people groups didn't happen? And right. what if they were the majority? And what if they had the power that they've always had in, in, in this whole world of thinking? And pro-indigenous across the board, right. right? I mean, you think about all, all, so many indigenous peoples connect better. Uh, it's an overgeneralization uh, stereotype, but but you know, they, they have had more time in this land, living out of this land and on this land and with this land. Somebody who comes in from the outside doesn't have that same relationship to, to, to yeah. space. Um, yeah, and I think there was early in the, in the beginning, there is an article from uh, an American indigenous. Oh, uh -huh. from the Americas, I think in, I want to say Montana. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if it's indigenous prophecy and Mother Earth. Oh, 
think um, there's also another one. But yeah, it talks about the same thing of how we've always, you know, are more in tune with the earth. You, sh you should step back and let yeah. us well, run sure. yeah. how, how you should be sustainable. Right. We, right. We've been doing it for forever. Well, and I, and I think that's one thing that, you know, to, to, to talk about this again in, in kind of spiritual terms. I mean, I think that's the language that Genesis uses to talk about Eden, right? I mean, Genesis uses this more sustainable stewardship language. You know, that was Adam's job, right? Adam, the, the humanity's job was to, uh, to care for uh, uh, the earth and to, to care for the garden. And, and I think there is a sense where um, so much of, again, this, this culture uh, shift of, uh, of colonization, of, of greed, of take, 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 um, uh, steps away from that biblical perspective, steps away from that uh, Edenic perspective. Um, and so I think there's uh, a lot to, to, to be learned from folks who are doing that well, who continue as they, if they're able, right? And so, so many indigenous peoples um, have lost that ability. I yeah. wanted to ask a question. What do you think about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos thinking that we'll only survive if we go out in space? <laughs> Are you talking about the line about- How much, uh, how much time do you get? What's the, the line in there? Uh, and I won't I won't read it because it's a little colorful. Uh, but uh, what page is it on? Uh, on page one forty one. Uh, uh, fun fact: Space wants you dead. Mars wants you dead. Titan wants you dead. Space will blank kill you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Which is kind of the I think I think that's the reaction to that point of well all we have to do is go out in space and we'll be fine. Um, and this tweet that that she's quoting here is uh, well <laughs> the next paragraph begins earth is easy mode yeah, uh, yeah it probably makes more sense and it's a lot less work to to, to kind of return to these kind of eugenic practices return to these stewardship caretaking practices uh than it does to go to titan <laughs> or to mars well, or somewhere else i mean it's it's doing it's making the same mistake we've we've done already right the idea of like oh it's we can't use this we we'll use something else Mm, yeah, right? it's, like, no, it's that's, colonizing Mars. You're, you're exactly. literally doing yeah. things, you're literally making the exact same mistake you did earlier. Like uh, instead of fixing what you have right, and saying, right, like, oh, we're uh, not doing it, right? Yeah. You just move on to the next, right? You know, yeah, right. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's it's remembering the Sabbath. Oh, um, but if I if I work that day instead, I can I can make more money, right? Right. right? right. If I if I go out and plow my field down that day, I, I can I can plant a new field. Yeah, that's right. 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 When you know, right? Or right. When instead the, when of the, sleeping, I can work. Like, yeah, I'm not going to be working as fast, but at least yeah. it's it's something. Like, yeah. no, that's that's a fallacy. You're, right. It'd be better if you slept. Right. It'd be better if you let the let the ground go. You know, fallow. Fallow. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then the time it's not, you're actually going to get a better produce. Yeah. You know, but, but that's not how that's not how you know, you, right. you think. Right. Oh, this, this land isn't working great. Well, we, there's Mars out there. We can figure out how to live out there. <laughs> right. What was that? I don't, know the, I don't know the time, but I expect maybe 50,000 years ago, the Earth maybe was inhabited with maybe a billion, a billion people instead of seven and a half billion. So, you know, there again, the carrying capacity of the Earth is as limited as a truck or a car. It can only produce a food for so many people. So they may have to go into space or go into fertilizer, one or the other. Yeah, this is this is where my my thought my thought experiments get kind of dangerous and <laughs> and, uh, and scary and is like you know wait does this mean we have to do population control? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know that's it's always kind of a, a dark a dark place of how. If this right, but there is there is a, well, a, a carrying capacity of, of how many people can live on Earth sustainably. And you don't have to go even to science fictiony, right? I mean, you have to you ask the question of, of, of China. You know, what is what is their response to that? And and, and did move to population control, right. and then that didn't work. They didn't have enough workers, and so they said, oh, I'm just kidding. Now you, you have to have two kids. Uh, and and so I think there's 
there is that question of how do you sustain in in such a um, overpopulated space, um, you know, the, the healthiest relationship. And, and um, I, you know, what I don't remember which article it was now. One of the uh, essays said we like to wag our finger at China. We like to wag our finger at Russia and say, uh, you know, they're not doing this right. But um, you know, three fingers are pointing back at us that the, the U.S. is um, uh, is is doing some things, but isn't there yet? And, and so let's let's yeah. keep working. That was probably a lot more than you uh, expected from that question, Marcia. <laughs> you didn't give us your answer. What do you think of, uh, um, are you, are you going to be the, the first one on the, uh, what's the next, the blue somebody something, the next rocket, rocket ship trip? I'm not sure. Well, if I had the money to spend, <laughs> I would love to take a spin around in the yeah. rocket ship. Yeah. <laughs> I've always loved space. Well, and I think I think the, the, the difference is um, between say NASA and, and you know, SpaceX is it was a government funded and, and this is from from science people talking. Um, this, is, this is not my own view, but I agree with it. Um, that it was, so it was initially made as a way of discovery, right? Mm -hmm. And out of that, we have we have advanced technology, right? Without, we I don't think I mean solar panels were made for spaceflight, mm -hmm. um, and now we and and so there's a lot of technology that was out of that. And I think the the biggest and my biggest critique is it's it's out of pockets of billionaires who have their own specific self interest in mind. Um, that's not about discovery, but more about, you know, capitalism, right? How do, how can I make money off of off of doing this? And it's not out of discovery or exploration. It's, it's out of. Yeah, know. I think it was that same Wakanda uh, essay that talked about Star Trek. Use the example of, you know, Star Trek is yeah. a very yeah. different. Um, you know, and, and it was great because all these different people talk about Mad Max and talking about Hunger Games, you know, all these kind of uh, stories that talk about how we're destroying the earth. But there are also, and then Wakanda was an example like Star Trek, these, uh, these cultural stories that, that give us hope, these cultural stories that say, okay, we can learn to be discoverers and not um, uh, takers, right? And part of the problem is a lot of folks that we call discoverers weren't discovering they were they were taking they were takers of the skies right uh and so can there really be a, a way uh of, of you know do no harm of um you know prime directive you know to use star trek language of this idea yeah. of we aren't going to uh impact we aren't going to harm these people as much as learn from them right which i think it then pointed out that like oh in order for us in order for in the in the star trek universe to get to this they also had to have like Mass world war world war that, three that pretty yeah. much yeah, destroyed right. all of earth in order right. for them to figure that out so yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, oh i guess we're done we're over we're over time it's i mean there's and there's a lot of i mean the, we haven't gotten to some of the the poems in the yeah I think right. some of the poems are are good uh, there's one so what i want to read for a benediction maybe that could be our final i really enjoyed the poems yeah oh i did too a couple of them man they they spoke in a different way it's a different side of your brain a different part of your yeah let me see if i can find one that, that i like that i can read oh, what's yeah, for time <clears throat> What's that, Marcia? Well, I was going to look it up, but uh, is it a book next time or is it the movie? I believe it's the movie next time. Okay. Which I think I want to get. I'll get with Chad and see. I think it's from Noah. Okay. But I'm going to see. I will. I will get with Chad and see if we can do like a century of the cinema. I think Kobe is okay enough that. Is that the one, The Beast of the Southern Wild? No, we're not. We watched that apparently last uh, last summer. So we're gonna we're gonna switch that with another film. No, Fern Gully is a Fern Gully is a cartoon. It's a yeah, 
I think that's the other reason I picked it is to get the. Are you going to do Fern Gully? What's that? Were you going to do Fern Gully? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. I think that's what it, I think that's what it is. Okay, because I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to try to do a sanctuary <laughs> of the cinema so we all can gather around and watch it rather than do it on our own. So. Yeah, we'll have to see. There's a there's a there's copyright for some films yeah, and not that's... for others, so we have to double check how we can do that. But I'm looking for a good poem. There's a lot of long ones, but I'm looking for a short one. Uh, how about some Mary Oliver? Oh, there you go. I think this was a good one. For years, every morning I drank from Black Water Pond. It was a flame. It was flavored with oak leaves and also, no doubt, the feet of ducks. It all, and always it assuaged me from the dry bowl of the very far past. What I want to say is that the past is the past and the present is what your life is and you are capable of choosing what that will be, darling citizen. So come to the pond or the river of your imagination or the harbor of your longing and put your lips to the world and live your life. Okay, so last Wednesday, next month, right? Fern Gully. Fern Gully. All right, thank you, McPeters. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye. -bye. At, oh, Matt, I uh, saw both crosses today as I went down Castle.